these ideas that I'm going on about, apart from just putting some metals in order of reactivity, they are used in our real world to give us metals that in our world exist in ores. Now ores, that's like the raw material from which we might get our metal, metal ore. The chemicals inside metal ores are quite often there are oxides. So over the lifetime of the earth, metals have reacted with oxygen and they're oxides now or they're sulfides or the very few are the pure metal itself like you can still find gold nuggets pure gold in our earth and the gold hasn't reacted away over the years because it's unreactive but the reactive metals have indeed reacted away and the reactive metals you find them as a compound in our world and the idea is how do we get the metals out of the raw metal ores that we find in our world and we use these displacement reactions so two metals that they ask about very commonly are how do we get iron and how do we get aluminium now some metals can be found as the pure metal gold for example many metals are found combined with oxygen aluminium oxide look aluminium oxide there is found in an ore called bauxite and iron oxide iron three oxide is, in a fa is found in an ore called hematite and there are some metals that are found, found combined not with oxygen but with sulfur and they would be sulfides like Copper one sulfide is found in an ore called calcite. Now this section we need to know how we can get the metals out and we use reactions and we use displacement reactions. So that's why, why it's in <coughs> this section <coughs> and the kind of reaction that happens is redox. A more reactive metal will displace a less reactive metal from its metal oxide here more reactive push out a less reactive copper from its oxide zinc gets oxidized copper oxide gets reduced redox such redox reactions can be used to get a metal from its ores <coughs> one element used to do such reactions is carbon now some of you might think carbon is not a metal okay i agree with that it's not a metal but we can put it on, on a reactivity series and it, it comes just below aluminium in the reactivity series. Um, I can show you a reactivity series with it in later. And the reason we use it is it's cheap. Charcoal, 95% carbon, it's cheap. So using charcoal to get the metal out of its ores is a cost effective way. Cheap and plentiful look to see where carbon fits there look carbon another element i want you to think about is hydrogen and i'm i'm going to just bring normal chemistry into that later but hydrogen is not a metal H sorry hydrogen is not a metal equally carbon is not a metal and these non-metals do have a reactivity series and we can put them in the metal reactivity series like that because if we're using carbon as a cheap plentiful source then if we had zinc oxide iron oxide nickel oxide tin oxide lead oxide hydrogen oxide copper oxide mercury oxide silver oxide gold oxide platinum oxide if those chemicals were in our world then heating with carbon the carbon be more reactive would take the oxygen away and would make the metal for us however carbon is less reactive than aluminium so carbon heating it with aluminium oxide no reaction whatsoever no good you cannot use carbon to get aluminium from aluminium oxide you can use carbon to get iron from its oxide but not 
anything that's above it. So this cheap way of getting metals from their ores happens with carbon being there with all the metals that are below carbon in the reactivity series. Um, I want you to learn the positions of carbon and hydrogen relative to the metals. So you might ask, why is hydrogen? Why do I want you to learn hydrogen? Well, which metals react with water? The metals that react with water are the ones that are more reactive than hydrogen. See, hydrogen H2O, hydrogen with oxygen. Anything more reactive will take the oxygen away, leaving hydrogen. So that displacement idea you can use when we're putting metals with water. What about metals with acids? Same thing. Acids have hydrogen ions. Metals more reactive than hydrogen will react in a dis displacement way because they're more reactive. Metals less reactive than hydrogen don't react with acids and don't react with water because they're less reactive than hydrogen. So reactions of acids and water can be explained in uh, these displacement reactions using the same ideas. Now getting iron from hematite. Right, this is the blast furnace. So I'm going to go through the blast furnace. Um, carbon is above iron in the reactivity series, point one. Point two, it can be used to react with that, which is in hematite, in a redox reaction, to get the iron out and separate from the oxygen. The iron ore is dug up out of the earth. It's known as hematite. The chemical inside it is Fe2O3, iron 3 oxide and that chemical in the ore is mixed with all kinds of other rubbish like sand etc um, and that, that's what we mean by th th the ore is just dug out of the ground it's raw material it's a mixture of things and quite a lot of those things we don't need like sand so we separate them out but then once we've got the iron 3 oxide chemical it's a compound we need to get the iron out of the iron three oxide chemical compound and the way we do it is we heat together we heat together coke we heat together coke with limestone and iron ore the hematite the hematite coke limestone and we blast air in at the bottom so the four things hematite coke limestone and air are put in to this thing called the blast furnace and the reactions that happen inside make iron for us and they get it out of the compound found in our earth called iron three oxide which is found in the ore known as hematite so industrial processes they on exams ask questions about industrial processes and they may well use these ideas in 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 an industrial process now my diagram my diagram of a blast furnace now you, you can criticize my diagram um, feel free to do so now, you criticize it you draw a better one there are five reactions i want to talk about four things go in coke that's your 95 percent carbon your iron ore that contains iron three oxide the coke is going to take the oxygen away making iron which is going to sink to the bottom you put limestone in i'll show you how limestone will deal with the impurities all the impurities in iron ore like sand they will be dealt with by limestone and they will be removed in a mixture above iron that floats on top of the iron and the mixture is called slag so we're going to go through five reactions very quickly i'm hoping to demonstrate it's the ideas that are important here the ideas of how this works. Reaction one. Sorry, maybe I didn't mention that hot air is blasted through these things at the side called toyers. The hot air reacts with coke. 
That's where the reaction starts. Reaction one, coke burns. Now when coke burns, it's exothermic. Heat energy comes out. And that, that exothermic energy keeps that blast furnace hot. Reaction two, the carbon dioxide you make, the carbon dioxide you make reacts with more coke. Reacts with more coke making carbon monoxide. It's the carbon monoxide in essence that ends up doing the reduction rather than carbon. I know we talk about carbon removing the oxygen but in the real process it's carbon monoxide that does so. Of course carbon would, carbon would take the oxygen away. It's just this blast furnace is a proven cheaper way of doing the whole process in a very practical um, real sense that's done around the world. And so reaction three, this is it. This is the redox reaction. Iron oxide loses the oxygen to three carbon monoxides. The three carbon monoxides turn into three carbon dioxides. And the iron oxide turns into iron. And that's a balanced equation. Look, oxidation, reduction, and therefore the whole thing is a redox reaction. There, I've got iron. Iron there can be tapped off, can be tapped off, and it's called pig iron when it comes out. Well, what about the impurities and the limestone? Not dealt with that yet, gonna do that now. So, reaction four, here, limestone. Limestone is calcium carbonate. Now, when heated, and that's hot in there, when heated, calcium carbonate turns to calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. It's a decomposition, thermal decomposition. I've talked about it before in a previous video. And then reaction five. Well, that, calcium oxide, that reacts with impurities like sand. So, let's have a look. Calcium oxide, sand is silicon oxide, and it makes calcium silicate. Now those silicates, the impurities end up there as silicates. So the limestone is needed to give the impurities or turn the impurities you've got into silicates which can be tapped off above the pig iron. And building blocks for building buildings, you know the internal blocks as opposed to bricks. Bricks are on the outside Cheap blocks are on the inside. Those big blocks, one block is about nine bricks big. Those big blocks are, um, I think they're called breeze block. I think they're called breeze block and they, they are this slag material. And those blocks are made from this slag material. So the mixture of impurities collected known as slag. That slag is the building material used to make building blocks. I've said that. The iron is collected in containers called pigs, so the final iron is pig iron. This iron is 95% pure iron, and is used to make bridges, etc. But pig iron is also used to make steel. Now, I would say that's the biggest use of iron, is to make steel. Now, you should know steel is an alloy, an alloy containing carbon and iron. Now, typically, the carbon is less than 1%, so you have to do a bit of chemistry on this pig iron to get its carbon down from 5% and when you've got it down you might add some other things to it like chromium and nickel and make stainless steel etc but basically the the starting material is pig iron and you do a bit of chemistry to turn it into steel now steel is much stronger less brittle um, and is more useful as a material than pure iron pure iron is a bit too brittle. The impurities present are mainly carbon, but you do have some other impurities. And to make high grade steels, you have to get rid of those impurities by doing some extra chemistry. To make different steels from pig iron, the impurities have to be removed. And the percentage carbon content controlled by blowing oxygen, reacting it with oxygen gets rid of the carbon because it turns to carbon dioxide. And you may add other elements to get whatever steel you need. 
Okay, so a few important slides there. Iron from hematite. You need to know what the starting materials are. You need to know the ideas behind mainly redox here. You need to know the ideas behind the redox are that the carbon is being used to remove the oxygen. Now I know here it does it in a roundabout way, but it is carbon that turns to carbon monoxide and then does the reduction. But it is carbon and we say that. The impurities are dealt with with the limestone, <coughs> the limestone reacting away, calcium oxide, making silicates, <coughs> etc. Main use is steel. One of the big disadvantages, one of the big disadvantages of using um, iron in things like clamp stands I've got in front of me or using them for gates is that they rust rusting rusting is a big problem and you need to know basic ways that rusting can be prevented and i hope you've done experiments like this now i could show you experiments here i've got the um, equipment but i've got diddy little test tubes and I've got diddy little nails. Um, I think we put these nails in there. That is, he says, that is an iron nail, small iron nail in a small test tube. And I can put a small iron nail in a small test tube and here, add some water. There, add some water, there, add some water, <coughs> hope you can see that. I can set up lots of different test tubes like that. I can set up that test tube there, which is got calcium chloride chemical with it. Now, calcium chloride is a drying agent and if I put a lid on that if I put a bung on that bung bung that up drying agent with iron nail then that test tube there is air only no water that test tube there if I boil water up and boil water up gets rid of the air that's in it boiled water and put some oil at the top that will stop air getting in. So that test tube would be water only, no air. This one is air and water. That's the one that I showed you. This one is if you put grease on the nail, does it rust? This one, salty water. That one, you have zinc coating the nail. Now, I can't do that one, but you can set up these kind of um, experiments and I'm pretty sure in your schools you would have done so. And what result do we get? Well, we get these results. That one rusts and that one rusts. So look, what does it tell you? Oh, it tells you that without water, you get no rusting. Without air, you get no rusting. If you grease your nail, you get no rusting. If you zinc plate your nail, you get no rusting. So where do you get rusting? You get rusting when you've got air and water. You need air and water, and it's not the air, it's the oxygen in the air. So you need oxygen and water in order to get rusting. And then this one here, salty water, you get lots of rusting because impurities speed up rusting here the impurity is salt salty water and air you get lots and lots and lots of rusting so that accelerates the rusting and you get more than you would do otherwise so 
you need to know how can we stop rusting and what is it and how can we prevent it i want you to know that rusting is hydrated iron oxide sorry i want you to know that rust is hydrated iron oxide that there iron oxide so you need the oxygen for the iron to react to the make iron oxide but remember copper sulfate remember water of crystallization rust has water of crystallization and that's what makes it flaky the flakiness the dot xh2o the x is variable it's not a fixed amount x is variable so we can call that hydrated iron oxide and the hydrated iron oxide is what i want you to know rust as well how can we stop that reaction well why don't we use a barrier method and put the iron in some kind of casing stop the oxygen getting to it well that's what the grease did remember the grease here if you grease up the nail then the oxygen can't get to, get to it can't rust etc we need both air and water rusting happens faster when you've got impurities only iron rusts if so if you get something like aluminium doing a kind of rusting reaction we call it corrosion every other metal is called corrosion it's only iron that we can use this word rust the grease nail did not rust attaching a more reactive metal to the iron if you are more reactive metal like wrap the nail in magnesium if you wrap it in magnesium it doesn't rust the more reactive metal will protect it and stop it rusting so what do you need to know well let's discuss how to stop rusting grease it that stops oxygen getting to it how about painting it or tin plating it all of those things would stop water and stop oxygen getting to the iron and then it can't rust the problem with tin plating is that if you scratch the tin underneath you've got the iron nail and underneath then it will start to rust well what if you use a more reactive metal than iron what if you use things like zinc well if it's more reactive and you kind of cover it with zinc then even if there's a scratch because more reactive the more reactive metal will react away and it'll protect the iron the iron will not do any rusting so long as it's in contact with a more reactive metal so you can wrap in magnesium or you can wrap with zinc or you can coat with zinc coat with magnesium whenever you use a more reactive metal that type of reaction is called a sacrificial protection because the more reactive metal reacts away and it sacrifices the more reactive metal and keeps the iron safe now that kind of method is used in big ships ships cost hundreds of millions of pounds big ones to make so you don't want them rusting away within a few months so you attach big chunks of magnesium to them and the big chunks of magnesium react away and before they react away completely you put new pieces of magnesium on there and the fresh magnesium will keep the ship from rusting so long as you keep changing the magnesium and that's the cheapest way to stop a ship from rusting away but if, if I've got my my gate my iron gate at home I just paint it the paint stops it rusting and you get questions about what are the most sensible ways of preventing rusting in an exam and you've got to use your common sense as to which one you're going to use for example you wouldn't paint the moving parts of a machine to stop it rusting because if they're rubbing against each other the paint will get rubbed off so machines are often grease you put grease on them you grease machines and you don't paint them uh, just just because it's common sense 
find the most sensible, most common sense way to stop rusting and um, then you'll be able to answer those questions hopefully. Finally, stainless steel. You need to know stainless steel is the steel that your kitchen sinks are made of um, and stainless steel, including kitchen appliances, sometimes they're made of stainless steel, they, they are made of stainless steel because you don't want them to rust and it's iron and carbon, that's what makes it a steel. To make it a stainless steel, it's got to have nickel and chromium as well. So it's expensive because of these other metals like chromium and nickel are expensive. So stainless steel is more expensive than iron and more expensive than normal steels. But then you can guarantee it's not going to rust. And that sometimes is really important, like in a kitchen. Well, I said to you that if you've got um, metals, then quite often they're in the form of oxides or occasionally you have sulfides. So if you've got sulfides like zinc sulfide, what do you do with them? Well, the first thing you do with them is you roast them in air. If you roast them in air, then the oxygen reacts with the sulfur, making sulfur dioxide gas. And the sulfide is changed into the oxide. And there you go. The oxide can be reacted with carbon or a more reactive metal to get it out of its ore. So you do the roasting and then they, they can be reacted with a more reactive element, maybe carbon to remove the oxygen, and thereby we can separate the metal from its ore. Same slide as before. So, reactive metals are really hard to get because it's, you've got to react them with something even more reactive. Anything below carbon, you heat with carbon. These very low down metals in the world occur naturally anyway. So what about metals that are more reactive than carbon? Well, if they're more reactive than carbon, then you've got to use something even more reactive than them. So aluminium oxide, for example. If you heat with carbon, you get no reaction. So you've got two choices. Either you get something more reactive than aluminium, like magnesium, but magnesium is very expensive. Heat it with magnesium. The magnesium being more reactive will take away the oxygen from the aluminium, making magnesium oxide and leaving aluminium. But there's a cheaper way and we're going to use electricity electrolysis. Now that's my Redox 3. So my Redox 3 will deal with how electrolysis will get us aluminium out of aluminium ore, which is known as bauxite. So above carbon, we Practically, we use electrolysis. Below carbon, we heat with carbon. Very unreactive elements we find in their pure state on Earth. So, I'm coming to the end of my... Um, I'm coming to the end of my displacement slides, Redox 2. But you have to be able to use these ideas in different ways in an exam. And one of the common ways that they give the, you these in an exam is to identify which metals are more reactive. And of course, all you've got to use there is the logic the more reactive metals will take the oxygen away or more reactive metals will end up in solution and they push out, then they will displace the less reactive metals. You need to be able to suggest experiments that should be done to give an unknown metal whereabouts in a reactivity series it's going to go.
You need to be able to identify a redox reaction. So identifying a, a reduction oxidation reaction, knowing what's being oxidized, what's being reduced. In these reactions, it's probably better just to think about oxygen. But oil rig can be used in these experiments, like I've explained uh, before and today as well. Displacement reactions can also happen in solutions. And I, I can show you a famous experiment next. In test tubes, we're going to put pieces of zinc, iron, magnesium and copper. Now you should know the order. The order of reactivity, copper is least reactive, magnesium is most reactive. Below magnesium, you've got zinc, iron. So it goes magnesium, zinc, iron, copper. Magnesium, zinc, iron, copper. And we're going to put them with metal sulfate solutions. Here, look. Magnesium, this is in order. Mink, uh, magnesium, zinc, iron, copper. Now, silver, 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 red, brown, metal. These are the metals. And these are the solutions. Magnesium sulfate is colourless. Zinc sulfate, colourless. Iron sulfate, very, very pale green. If you've got like a test tube or a small beaker, it looks colourless. But the copper sulfate looks blue. I'm only going to show you one of these. Um, I know I've actually I've shown you one at the beginning. I, I did for you zinc with copper sulfate. I did that one, reaction nine. I put some zinc pieces into copper sulfate to show you a displacement reaction. And you've got to be able to work out where you're going to get reaction. So look, where do we get reaction? There, there, there. Why do we get reaction where the ticks are? Well, that's where the more reactive metal is reacting with a solution of a less reactive sulfate. So for example, that one, oh, there's a tick missing. Tick missing out of that one. Red pen, tick. I've left a tick out. So that should be a tick. I can't write on that, that's a TV. Um, I should put that into my PowerPoint. I'll try and change my PowerPoint, make it correct. But tick there, because zinc is more reactive. It pushes out copper, you get zinc sulfate and copper being pushed out, you get reaction. Well, what about that one? Magnesium sulfate with iron, no reaction. Why? Well, the iron is less reactive than magnesium. It won't do the displacement reaction. Being less reactive, the magnesium sulfate will stay in solution. And the, these are quite interesting. These four yellow boxes, because here you've got zinc with zinc sulfate. Now, zinc with zinc sulfate may well push out the zinc, take its place. But what do you get? Well, you get zinc and zinc sulfate. What did you start with? Zinc and zinc sulfate. And there's nothing new made. As a function of nothing new made, then we can say there's no reaction. So if, if I just summarize all of those three types of reactions, when there's a reaction, it's the more reactive, the more reactive metal that pushes out in a displacement reaction, the less reactive metal and the more reactive metal ends up in solution. Now, you can read through all that if you want, but that's basically what I'm saying. Look, copper metal is formed of the red brown metal and the red brown metal coats pieces of magnesium if you use it um, w when the magnesium solid is added to copper sulfate. And it looks as though the magnesium is turning red-brown. Well, the copper's forming on top of it. That's why. And the copper sulfate gets less blue because there's less copper sulfate. As the reaction happens, the copper sulfate is changing into some other sulfate. The other sulfates are colourless. Using these ideas, you should be able to write equations for the reaction like that. Now, displacement. Can you identify those as displacement? Magnesium with copper sulfate. Magnesium gets oxidized. The copper ions there are changing to copper. That's the main equation, balance equation. 
This is an ionic equation because the sulfates are spectator ions. So ionic equations leave out spectator ions. Leaving out spectator ions, you can see that the copper is gaining electrons, reduction, rig. The magnesium, losing electrons, oil, oil rig. Magnesium being oxidized, copper ions are being reduced, sulfate are spectator ions, magnesium is the reducing agent, copper ions are the oxidizing agent. Ideas that I've covered many times in these, these two sections so far. What about the no reaction reactions? Well, either there's no reaction because what you make, like magnesium with magnesium sulfate, there's no reaction because what you make is exactly the same as what you started with, or there's no reaction because the metal is less reactive. It's not reactive enough to react. So here, copper, not reactive enough. It's not going to push out the magnesium because magnesium is more reactive. Remember, remember the more reactive metal will end up in solution, displacing the less reactive metal from its solution right okay so um i'll probably split that into two videos and post it so next time redox three as the final uh, video for gcse i'll stop there